Good morning, my name is Darren and I'm the Vicar at Christ Church or Sagen. A very warm welcome to you all. We'd love to welcome you personally, but we can only do that if you say hello in the comments. I thought some of you might like to see the inside of our church building today. We've been working on our planning and preparation for opening the church for personal prayer. If all goes well, will open on Mondays starting on the 29th of June. We'll provide more details in the coming week. It's Father's Day today, a day that comes with mixed emotions. For many this it will be a joyful day. For others it will be a difficult day for a range of reasons. Our prayers later in today's service will try to express this. Today it's also Father's Day in the US and will no doubt be a difficult day for the family of George Floyd. In today's service we'll be exploring how we can engage with the Black Lives Matter movement and play our part in the fight to eradicate racism. But first I invite you to focus on the Lord our God. Every single one of us as a good, good Heavenly Father who loves me and loves you, every one of you. And so let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and be with us as we gather, as we praise you, as we look at your word. Amen. Dan and Sarah are going to lead us as we worship our Heavenly Father. Happy Father's Day, everybody. We're going to start our worship with singing about our good, good Father in heaven and celebrating him. Bye. 
to remind us that he made us all so unique and so you di so different and so special and precious. Kids, I know you know this one. So if you could join in the actions with me, that'd be fantastic. Each of us in a 
message will be today. Let's find out. Today we celebrate our fathers, our dads, our granddads and all those that have been like dads to us. We say thank you to God for them and we say thank you to them for all that they've done for us and all that they are to us. Some of our children have special messages for their dads and granddads and are going to share with us some of the things that they love to do with them and some of the reasons that they love them. I love my dad because he gives me hugs and he makes me laugh. I love daddy because he reads me I love daddy because I love daddy because he does his hide and seek. I love daddy because he plays with me. Film rights. Thank you, God, for my popsy. dad and daughter time before teas before we have our tea like riding my bike and watering the plants and going on the swing and to clean, and helping daddy cleaning the van I like playing with my dad Happy Father's Day Daddy I love it when Daddy tells me rubbish jokes. I love it when Daddy tucks me in bed and reads me a story. We love you, Daddy. We love you. What's your favourite thing to do with Grandad? Dad, old cake. You like to eat cake with Grandad? It's a cake, Grandad. It's a cake. Eating cake. Please. <laughs> Father's Day, Grandad. I'll follow Dad. I love 
love Daddy because he's kind and caring and he's very fun to play with. I love Daddy because he plays with me with mm. the football figures. Teddy loves Daddy because he always gives him big hugs. We love you, Daddy. We love you, Daddy. Our dads and granddads can be really special to us and they can be good fathers to us. But no dad is perfect. But we all have a good, good father who is perfect in all of his ways. And that is God. Now we're going to have a look in this bag. Now in this bag I've got some objects that are going to help us think about how God is a good, good father. Shall we take a look? Right, shall we take out the first object? Oh, it's a big one. I wonder if you know what this is. Hmm, it's a shield, isn't it? A shield that soldiers might have had in battle. And what does a shield do? Well, it protects us, doesn't it? It keeps us safe. And God is a good, good father who protects us and keeps us safe. Shall we have a look at what the next object is? I bet you've all got one of these at home. A Bible. Now, what's a Bible for? Lots of different things, but it is to teach us, isn't it? So God is a good, good father who teaches us. And he teaches us his ways. And when we have all those questions about life, we can ask God about them, can't we? Let's have a look what else we've got in this bag. Oh, this is a bit of a strange one. I wonder if you know what this is called. It's a stethoscope. And this is used by doctors. So why might we have this? God is a God who heals and a God who makes us feel better. God is a good, good father who not only can make us feel better, but he will comfort us when we're not feeling well. I wonder what else is in here. Oh, an apple. We all need to eat, don't we? There are things that we need to live. And God is a good, good father who provides what we need. Now, he won't always give us everything we want, but he gives us what we need because he knows what we need. So that's what Apple is representing. Let's see what else I have in here. Oh, this is the noisy one. A tambourine. Mm. Now, we like to make music and we like to enjoy life. And God is a good, good father who fills our life with music and laughter because he gives us joy within our hearts and souls. So there we have it, musical instrument. And I've got one final one. I wonder if you can guess what the last object is in my bag. God is a good, good father who loves us. And that... I think is the most important thing of all. Because in God's love, we find out who we are. We are children of God, loved by him. Now I wonder which of these objects, which of the things that they represent, seems most important to you today? Is it knowing that we have a God who protects us, a God who teaches us, a God who can make us well, a God who provides what we need, a God who fills our life with joy, or a God who loves you? Just take a moment to look at these objects. And to think about that question that I've just asked. 
and in a moment the objects will disappear. And I'm going to give you a bit of time to write down or draw what the objects are to see if you can remember all six. And then they will come back and you can see how many you got. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. How many did you remember? Did you get all six? God is a good, good father who protects us, teaches us, makes us feel better, gives us what we need, fills our lives with joy and laughter. And most of all, he loves us. He is a good, good father who is perfect in all of his ways. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for our fathers, for our dads, for our granddads, and all of those who have been like dads to us. And thank you, God, for being our good, good father, perfect in all of your ways and loving us so much that we can be secure in your love forever. Amen. Today, you might like to make a card for your dad. Here's a simple one that I've made just written thank you daddy on it but you could draw something maybe that you love about your dad or like doing with your dad and you could give that to him you could also do it for your granddad or any of those people that have been like dads to you many of us have had quite a few people in our lives who are special to us for particular reasons maybe it'd be nice to send them a card today to say thank you to them What fantastic messages for some special dads and granddads. And thank you Rachel for that great message about our good, good Father in Heaven. Now I read from Acts chapter 10 starting at verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the, man, the men, 
I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who was respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Ali just read an extract from Acts chapter 10. You might find it helpful to read the whole chapter. In our Bible reading, Peter had an extraordinary vision. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. The sheet contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. The sheet contained a mixture of clean and unclean creatures. Then a voice told Peter, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now, according to the Torah, Peter was forbidden to eat ceremonially unclean creatures. The idea was repulsive to Peter, so he replied, Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Then God nullified the ceremonial food laws by saying, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Just to underline the importance of this, Peter received the vision three times. When Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment, he replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Now Peter was a Jew who had become, become a follower of Jesus. There is no doubt that Peter loved the Lord. He loved the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind and with all his strength. The evidence for this is clear in his life. Peter was an apostle and became the leader of the early church. The Lord had already used Peter powerfully. On the day of Pentecost, for example, 3,000 people became Christians because of Peter's preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. And from that day, Peter continued to share the good news. But did Peter really love his neighbour? When we become Christians, there will still be things that need to change in our life. It's part of the ongoing transformation to becoming more like Jesus. Not just knowing they're just not just loving Jesus, but knowing Jesus' heart and converting to Jesus' ways. So far, all of Peter's ministry had been about taking the good news of Jesus to the Jews. Despite Jesus' command to take the good news to all nations, Peter had a bias. Now Israel, the nation to which Peter belonged, had been persecuted by many nations down the ages. Israel was supposed to be a light and a blessing to all nations, but they repeatedly failed in their calling, keeping that light and that blessing for themselves. To Peter, Romans were not only unclean, but brutal dictators who had murdered many Jewish people. But clearly, not all Romans were like this. Peter needed to change his preconceived notions about people who were not like him. Peter was prejudiced. While Peter was still trying to make sense of the vision, there was a knock at the door. The Lord had also given a vision to Cornelius, a Roman centurion, and told him to send men to bring Peter to him. The Holy Spirit spoke to Peter 
and Peter did something that would have been unthinkable to him only the day before. He invited a Roman soldier into the place where he was staying. The next day, Peter went with the Roman soldier and the other two men and met with Cornelius as an equal and they shared their stories. Peter's eyes were opened and it marked the beginning of a radical change in the church. On that day, the doors of the church began to be opened to all nations. Peter said to the large gathering, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. Peter was made aware of his bias and did something about it. Peter had a new attitude towards his neighbour. He began to understand what loving your neighbour really means. Peter then shared the good news of Jesus. And while he was still speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Something significant needed to happen so that the Gentiles, that's you and me, could also enjoy fullness of life through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are worshipping here today because Peter responded and did something significant. The Black Lives Matter movement cannot have passed you by. I wonder if you, like me, have been trying to work out how to respond. I can't stay in that place of silently, silently reflecting any longer. So I've asked Dave, my friend and brother in Christ, to share his thoughts and some of his story. Hello, I'm David Hermit. I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts around the Black Lives Matter campaign. I wonder what Jesus would do if he was faced with this same scenario. Thank you, Darren, for inviting me to speak on this at church. And I hope that what I have to say will help all of us to consider these matters and perhaps make some changes in the future. I've been asked to share my personal perspective. The Black Lives Matter campaign has come into global focus because we all know the truth. We all watched a man die with an officer leaning on his neck. George Floyd repeatedly said, I can't breathe. And he was ignored. He wasn't listened to. As a result, he died. And some people have responded to that by becoming violent. Some people have responded to that by doing things like overthrowing statues. Last weekend, I felt that I needed to respond. And I responded by posting some things on social media, on Facebook. And I, it was remarkable how much um, of a response that gave as well in, in terms of people coming back to me. I spoke about several things in my blog post. First of all, I spoke about unconscious bias. For those of you who don't know what unconscious bias is, it is the thing where in our unconscious we are biased against certain people, not because of any one particular thing, but because they are different. Our brains have been programmed so that if we see a woman, uh, we think babies. If we see a baby, we think woman. And so when we see a woman with a baby, that fits our mental constructs quite easily. If, however, we see a man with a baby, particularly if they turn up a toddler group, then it's unusual. And so we notice that. Similarly, if you're in a battle and you're on one side 
and you notice that the enemy has done something, then you are trained to respond to that by fighting against it. Because that's what you do. You fight against your enemy or your perceived enemy. Today, I'd like to get you to think about becoming not a warrior who's fighting for or against something, but maybe as a scout. The scouts are slightly different. What a scout does is they go and have a look. They go on ahead and they examine the facts. In an army situation, they might go and scout out the terrain and decide whether or not there's a river that could be crossed here. And they have to put to one side their preconceived notions of what they might find and just go and look. In some ways, it's like the scientific method. And the scientific method is one of gathering facts, gathering facts, gathering facts, and then coming to a conclusion. Whereas what unconscious bias does is it comes to the conclusion without gathering any facts, because we know that statistically it's most likely to find certain things go together. You see, this global response to what happened to George Floyd is an eruption of people believing that something has to be done to change the way in which some people have been treated purely because of the colour of their skin. So what did I post? I posted a um, picture and in that picture it says, we said black life matters. We never said only black life matters matters. We know all life matters. We just need your help with the hashtag Black Lives Matters. For black lives are in danger. As I said, I talked about unconscious bias, first of all, and then I started to speak about what it was like for me and my personal experience of growing up in London as a young black man. I grew up in the 1960s and 70s in London, and at that time, it was okay to be openly racist. There were no laws particularly about racial hatred, and people couldn't be prosecuted for calling me a nigger, or doing all the other sorts of things that happened as I was growing up. It's not wasn't an easy time, but as someone who was quite athletic, um, I was thought of as being someone who might go on to do a life in sport. And I felt that what I was really interested in was being academic and learning because I love learning. I love finding out new things. I love doing research and finding new things out about different things. And so as a result, I worked hard at school. I paid attention. I did all my homework. I got strong qualifications and eventually I became a teacher. But as I became a teacher, some people said you'd never become a head of department. Others said you'd never move on into senior leadership. Others said you'd never become a leader of a additional trust. All of those things have happened over the last 30 odd years that I've been a teacher, but they happened against the odds. You see, we are in a system in which people like myself, it's very unlikely that we would get through. There are so many barriers put in our way. And those barriers mean that as we speak, around 3% of secondary head teachers in a whole country are not white. Just 3%. An even fewer percentage of head teachers move on to senior, senior leadership in a trust and to be a CEO, of which I am one of a handful. It's interesting to think back to my family when they first came to the Great Britain. And when they arrived in London, expecting to find that they would be welcomed, they found signs like this one. Signs saying, no blacks, no Jews, no Irish, no dogs. They came to this country expecting to be welcomed with opened arms, invited by the government, on the Windrush, we see this generation of people who have come and thought that their talent was going to be put to good use. In fact, more often than not, their talent was ignored and it was wasted. Even worse, when they came into the life of the church and they approached the church, they were not welcomed with open arms. In fact, 
they found that the only way they could worship would be to form their own churches. And so we've ended up in this country with some churches that are black majority, what I would call blackwashed churches. And we've got some churches that are white majority, that are whitewashed churches. And I have to say, to me, it seems silly that we should be in a position where the church is not just one church, mingling of all the races. This unconscious bias, what it means is that sometimes when people are different, they just don't feel welcomed. And because they don't feel welcomed, then those micro things that sometimes people give off in body language means that they feel really they need to leave and go and do something else. One of my daughters told me a story about how someone said to her, you're very articulate for a black girl. She remember other daughters have told me about how they felt very, very under pressure at school to conform and to be to be something different to the person they were. That beauty in terms of what it should look like in hair and colour was challenged and they were told that they weren't beautiful. If it just been my family that suffered these things, then maybe you could say that I had a chip on my shoulder. But actually, this is not just my family. You speak to any black person in this country and they can tell similar stories. Stories about how they've been stopped by the police. A particular story of mine was when I had become a teacher and I went to visit my friend and he lived in Oxford. And as I'd finished visiting him, I went back to my car with my keys and was about to get into the car. And I was surrounded by a group of white men. And they said to me, why are you trying to steal that car? I've got the keys. This is my car. I'm not stealing anything. We're calling the police. At this point, my friend, who was just living two doors up from where I parked the car, came out and he had to come and vouch for me and say that actually, no, he's a teacher. That is his car. And he's come to visit me. What would have happened if my friend wasn't there? You see, these sorts of experiences don't always happen to everyone. And the Black Lives Matter is speaking up for people who feel that they can't breathe that their life chances are being choked. You see, in this country, it's not many people who are dying as a result of being black. But what we're finding is that as people try to make their way in the world, as they try to make their careers, as they try to do other things, they face obstacles. Women in our society talk about smashing through the glass ceiling. For those of us who are of colour, we talk about breaking through the concrete ceiling. It's different. It's harder. You see, there is some systemic unfairness that is within the workplace that translates into the statistics of so few black people being in certain roles. You see, my hope for future generations is that this would all be different. That racism will be something of the past. And sadly... In my lifetime, I can't say that that's really happened. The system is already still mitigating against people of colour being their full versions of themselves. So let's come to the Christian side of all of this. Some of you as Christians read my blog post and have said lots and lots of positive things about how you didn't really understand. Uh, one of my white friends said something like this. He said, I used to be part of the All Lives Matter and I used to say this Black Lives Matter really is just an overinflation. And he said that he changed his mind. And the reason he changed his mind is he started to think about an analogy of saving rhinos. And he said, OK, I get it now. We focus on saving rhinos because rhinos are in danger. They could die out. They're the ones that are in danger. Another one of my friends talked about houses that were on fire, four houses on fire. And if a house is on fire, then that is the house that you need to put the water on. And it's almost as if someone in another house that isn't on fire saying, well, why are you putting the fire out there? They've missed the point that this is where the danger is and this is where we need to respond. So as Christians, 
What would Jesus do? How would Jesus respond to this? Well, I spoke before about the scientific method and about a scout going out and looking at things. You see, what Jesus might do is he might consider things from a point of view of the science. And we know that the DNA scientists are coming up with all sorts of breakthroughs at the moment over the last 30 years. And they've started to challenge the whole concept of race. And what they've done is they've looked at people's DNA and they've looked at where it originates. And they're finding that actually most of everyone's DNA seems to come from Africa. How interesting. They are saying that Africa is one of the most diverse continents in the world. A huge number of different languages spoke, huge number of different cultures, all on one continent. And they're fascinated by that. Those of you that are interested in family history, like me, you might have started speaking to people in older generations about your ancestors. And what you might find is that far from being from just one place, your ancestors come from all over the world. In my case, some of my ancestors are Irish. And the reason that they went to Jamaica was because of a famine in 1845 that meant that Irish people scattered throughout the world. And so I'm part Irish. Some of you listening to this, you might be part Irish as too. And some of you listening to this, you might actually be my third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh cousin, for all I know, even though you're not black. You see, this myth that somehow we can divide up the world by the colour of their skin really does need to be busted. We need to start to think, what would Jesus do? And this is where I come back to the Bible. In the Bible, we read about Jesus going and meeting with Samaritans. In the Bible, we talk about Jesus healing the sick and anyone who came to him was healed. In the Bible, we read about Jesus challenging the system. And the one violent act of Jesus overturning tables in the temple was when he got to a point where he said enough is enough. You see, when people asked Jesus about what it was that we should do, he said, love the Lord your God. That was your first priority. And your second priority was to love your neighbour as yourself. To which the question was, who is my neighbour? And you see, our neighbour is actually those people who are different to us. Our neighbour includes people who have got different experiences to us, different lifestyles. And if we are truly going to live out the gospel, if we're going to live out the Ten Commandments, if we're going to live out everything, Jesus is saying you only need to do two things. Love God and love your neighbour as yourself. How might this therefore be played out? Just to help me, I'd like you to just close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, I'd like you to think about a picture of Jesus. I'd like you to think that you're there in front of Jesus and you are going to give an account of what you have done in response to George Floyd's death. And as you think about that, I'd like you now to open your eyes. When you pictured Jesus, did you picture a white man with a beard, with blue eyes, blonde hair? Or did you picture someone with olive features, very much like my own? Someone whose mother came from a Jewish ancestry of people who lived near the equator. People whose skin colour would naturally have been dark. You see, we've turned Jesus into an anglicised Western Jesus. He was never that. That's something that we have developed in this Western church. And this is a time when we should really start thinking about Jesus in a different way. Jesus, who is our brother, as well as our saviour, we are his siblings, black, white, slave, free, Jew, Gentile, all brothers in Christ, all sisters in Christ. And Jesus left us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, with what we call the Great Commission, 
but a very simple thing that he asked us to do. He said, go out and make disciples of all nations. Not some nations, all nations. In our everyday lives, I'm going to translate that into a challenge to all of us. Go out and make friends with all people, regardless of their background. To finish, I'm going to come back to unconscious bias. You see, the thing about unconscious bias is it affects us all. I need to repent just like anybody else of unconscious bias. I need to repent of the times in which I've looked at someone maybe who's got disability and I've made assumptions about them. Maybe I've looked at somebody who is from a different ethnicity and I've made assumptions about them. Maybe i am said to you as a white person an assumption that you actually you're going to be against me. And that if you criticise me, it'll be because you're criticising me because of my colour. You see, ultimately, it can be very, very difficult living in a black skin. It can be difficult because sometimes when things happen that are bad, when you've been treated unfairly, you don't know. Was that just because I did something wrong or was it just persecution because of the colour of my skin? As Christians... We can lead the way in this nation. We can be the ones who start to put together this whitewashed church and this blackwashed church and to work together to demonstrate to the world that we as Christians are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Thank you, Dave. I've watched this several times with tears in my eyes. How do you feel? I hope you've been challenged. We need to put water on the burning house. We need to be aware and take control of our biases, both conscious and unconscious, rather than allow them to take control of us. We need to make friends with people regardless of their background. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I think our response should start with a personal and corporate confession. You may want to join in with the responses in white. Lord God of justice and mercy, we confess our unconscious bias. Help us to be conscious of our actions, to eradicate prejudice from our lives and choose to follow your ways. Lord God, you created us in divine likeness, diverse and beautiful. Every person is made in your image. But too often we fail to recognise your image in all people. Forgive us and transform us. Lord God, you created us in divine freedom to be free. In every decision, we can choose the path of justice. Too often, we fail to choose to advocate for your justice for all people. Forgive us 
and transforms. You created us for divine abundance to tend and share. In every garden, every social structure is your seed of community. But too often we fail to create that community which includes all and gives to all equal access to your abundant life. Forgive us and transform us. Open our eyes to distinguish good from evil. Open our hearts to desire good over evil. Strengthen our wills to choose good over evil so that we may create among us your beloved community. God's gift of grace in Jesus Christ forgives us and sets us free to live lives in community. We may go forth confident of the grace to see with new eyes beyond racial prejudice. To imagine with renewed passion, justice and mercy for all. And to create with a new will, a community where all are given access to God's abundant life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're now going to have a time of prayer led by members of Adrienne and Mark's growth group and also an associate member. After which, Dan and Sarah will lead us as we continue to worship the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you on this Father's Day, knowing that you are Father of us all, guiding, nurturing and sustaining us. You have called us to be your family, and through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have revealed your love and united us as your children. Gracious God, you created the entire earth in all its wonder and glory. Thank you that in your greatness and holiness you invite us to call you our Father and want us to relate to you through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, we gained access to your presence any time of day or night. Thank you, loving Father, for the peace, hope and strength that knowing this gives us. Please teach us as your children to tune in and listen to your voice, earnestly seeking your will. Through your Son, may we remain connected to you. Through your Word, please feed us. And through your Spirit, lead us into the coming week as your children. Heavenly Father, our Father, we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, bless and thank you for my daddy and all of the daddies. Thank you for looking after us and for all of the love they give us. Bless them, mercy, Lord. 
Lord, we give you thanks for our beautiful children and the many ways in which they enrich our lives. And we say, say these, these words in your, your mighty name, name Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Father God, thank you for those who are fathers by adoption, fostering in three-step families. Thank you for the care and love they bring. But Father, we raise up to you those for whom today is a difficult day. Those who are separated from their earthly fathers by geography, relationship breakdown. We pray especially for those who have lost their father, be it recently or many years ago. Please bring comfort to the bereaved and those who grieve. We pray also for those who desire to be a father, but for whom that is not in your plan at the present time. Please give them patience and trust in you. Lord, in the difficult situations, bring your peace. Dear Lord, we pray for fathers, mothers, carers and their families in the current situation. We ask that you would help them as they multitask in the roles of parent, worker or teacher. As a parent, please help them to keep their children safe and happy. As a worker, please enable them to manage their work commitments from home if appropriate. As a teacher to their children, please help them to provide structure and support in educating and in encouraging their children in their learning at home. We thank you, Lord, that you have been with us throughout lockdown. We recognise that for some, family life has been strengthened, but that for others, it has been a very difficult and stressful time. We pray that the virus will soon disappear so that all children can return to school again in September. Amen. Thank you, Chris. And now join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we're going to continue our worship this morning uh, with a couple of songs looking at the faithfulness of our Father God and how all his promises to us are yes and amen.
join the online coffee and chats after the service, even if you can only come for five minutes. The slides that follow provide the joining instructions for the Zoom meeting. God loves everyone. 
Let's make that love known through everything we do and say. And the blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. So folks, I hope you have a great day and I do hope to see you in the coffee and chat. Take care. Yeah.